Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Peter Shahashi, hey. and this is a drug reporter story from the stories from the front lines. It's a live video series. Uh, with these videos, we would like to show what is happening on the ground uh, from the perspective of uh, people working uh, in harm reduction and how the COVID-19 epidemic affects the lives of uh, people who use drugs and harm reduction services in different uh, cities of uh, Europe and the world. So today we will uh, speak about the situation in, uh, in the Netherlands. Mm, I have two uh, uh, guests here, uh, Auke Polder and Cedric Chavé from uh, the organization uh, AMOC, uh, or the Harm Reduction Program AMOC, which is operated by the Regenbo uh, Foundation. This is an Amsterdam-based uh, harm reduction program. Uh, hello, guys. How are you? Hey, good morning. Absolutely. Hi. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Uh, can you first uh, speak a bit about uh, AMOC and, and what kind of uh, services do you provide? What is AMOC about? Uh, yes, yeah. In, um, AMOC is a shelter for European homeless. So we, we support um, people that are legally in Holland, but don't have the right uh, to care. Um, we're working with homeless and with people who use drugs mainly. In Amok, we have a drop-in, so where people can uh, have breakfast, take a shower, uh, drink coffee, change their clothes, that kind of basic uh, needs. Then we have a drug consumption room, um, a night shelter, and uh, quite a big social work team. With, with people from, from different European countries who can support uh, our clients. Uh, how, how does this uh, crisis affect the, the people you are working with, the, your clients' lives? Uh, well, when the, um, when the lockdown started in Amsterdam, a lot of, a lot of shelters closed. So, there were a lot of homeless people who, who didn't have access to food and to shower and to a bed. So that's a few weeks ago, the situation was quite difficult for, for homeless people. Um, also the shelters who were still open, like Amok, we, they, they all had the maximum amount of clients who, who can enter. So that, that made, so, so a lot of people didn't yeah, had access uh, to shelters. I think uh, three weeks ago or something, the government started to realize that it is a problem and they supported um, our organization and also other organizations uh, to be able to open more shelters. Uh, the Regenbal Foundation, for example, opened now three new day shelters and a big night shelter where hundreds of people can sleep. So actually in, in, in this sense, uh, the crisis uh, has a positive effect on the homeless because there's more shelters organized. On the other hand, it's also so, so that uh, due to the crisis, a lot of people don't have um, possibilities to make money. So the jobs, um, there's no jobs, like no easy jobs. Uh, there's no people who donate money on the streets. The people who sell newspapers, yeah. They don't sell them anymore. So this is an, uh, yeah, an issue that the homeless people are, are, yeah, are dealing with. Yeah, I suppose it's really strange uh, now to walk on the streets of Amsterdam because it's usually very crowded with tourists. And now I suppose yes. it's quite uh, like Not empty. The world. Yeah. Um, uh, so how, how, how does uh, the lockdown affect the drug market? Is, do you do you? see any, any changes in the drug market, like uh, prices of the drugs are going up or something like that? At the moment, at the moment, we don't see a change. Mm -hmm. um, what we ask in the drug consumption room to the client is, do you notice a change in quality and price? For now, there is no messages saying so. I think it will be interesting to ask this question within the next three months because I did ask to clients and professional of our partners and there are conflictual messages. 
but there is still heroin or and cocaine to be found in the street of Amsterdam. Just our clients are struggling so much to make money. Uh, we start to see that some of them would like to find more methadone in the street instead of relying on their, let's say, heroin street dealers. And uh, some new substance did appear, but we don't know if it's temporary or if it's just a way to cope with the shortage of money. Mm -hmm. Your prime minister called the Dutch approach as the intelligent lockdown. So what, how does it work in, in reality? Like how stri strictly uh, the police is enforcing it? Okay, just I would like to say a couple of things about how the COVID-19 did affect our operating uh, services. Because finally, we, we are open, but we have a limited amount of clients per day who can access the drop-in center. It's 20 in the morning, 20 in the afternoon. Everybody who come in has to wash their hands. Then they have to be very clear with the service they need. Once they have the service they, have, they need provided, they have to leave the building and they are asked to come the next day. So this has a direct impact on the amount of service we can provide. Instead of 70, 80 clients a day, we have a maximum of 40. Inside the drug consumption room itself, we also had to limit the physical distance. So from a user's room, which used to be 18 to 20 clients at the same time using drugs, we accept four clients at a time, one per table. Everybody has to wash his hands. And once they are finished with using, we ask them nicely to leave the building and let's leave the, the room for another users. In terms of intelligent lockdown, what they mean is that in comparison to other countries, we didn't put everybody indoor with no possibility of going outside. The advice of the government is to ask the people to be smart enough to take their own measures, not gather together, take enough distance when you go for a walk with your friends. That means you can still go for a walk with your friends, but you are asked to stay maybe two, three meters uh, distance from him and you can go in the park. But other things have been closed, like playground are closed, uh, uh, football field are closed. Um, and the police has been patrolling um, at the beginning of the intelligent lockdown, let's say they have been talking to the population and nowadays uh, they are more asking the people, what are you doing here in the street? What is your purpose? You have nothing to do here. Just go back home, please. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the ca coffee shops? Are they still open? Yes, coffee shops are open. Uh, like many of the service, uh, Horeca, they call it, hotel, restaurant, cafe, they had to close as much as a coffee shop should close. But finally, those Horeca, hotel, cafe, restaurant, and coffee shop, they can operate if it's takeaway or delivery. So for the coffee shop, it's one person at a time. You go in, you buy your marijuana, and you leave the building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, uh, what about like uh, opiate substitution programs? Do the clients have access to the, their yes. medications for a longer time? So this has been uh, one of our fights from the day one. I understood right away from uh, the lifestyle that our clients are experimenting that it will be very complicated for them to access money and drugs. So we requested from the day one to the health authority to make sure that anybody with no criteria whatsoever could access substitution program, whatever it's heroin, methadone, or what exists in the Netherlands. It took about a month and a half for the authority to accept and to put in place some measures to facilitate the access to methadone substitution. But it has not been as easy as other countries like UK or France. Uh, so then we can, we can see that sometimes the Dutch authorities are not as progressive as their uh, reputation, right, Aukje? Yeah, you can say that it is, this is in, like Cedric said, it is difficult to get access to the methadone project, yes. Yeah. Uh, so you say, Cedric said that uh, the drug consumption rooms are uh, open with some uh, restrictions, like you have to wash your hand and things like that. Uh, do you also uh, uh, try to test uh, people who have symptoms for COVID or what, what do you say when someone is coming who is coughing or you yeah. don't even let him in or how is it working? 
Um, yes. Yeah, we let people in, and if we see signs uh, of people coughing a lot, then normally they don't cough or they have a fever. We call we call a nurse uh, from the health service, and a nurse comes to check the person. If the nurse also thinks that it could be COVID, then um, the nurse takes the client to a um, quarantine place. There are three quarantine places for, for homeless people in Amsterdam. And now there are, I think, 20 people inside. Mm -hmm. There, yeah. So in many cities, uh, uh, the, the problem was that, you know, the people who use drugs and who are homeless they just they, they just can't use the the quarantine shelters because because they have to go out to buy the drugs so how do you solve the situation in amsterdam yeah they can access these quarantine places and they get a lot of medicines like methadone inside places uh yeah to use yes it works the, fine. the client of the user's room we suspected to have uh, corona they went in the quarantine hotel from the first second, they have the maximum dose of methadone to make sure they stay in the hotel. Okay. And if, if they use other drugs such as stimulants, how are they? They will not be able so much to live in and out the hotel. That's why we provide with the highest amount of methadone and probably some benzos or some other mood regulators to make sure that the person is feeling safe and stress less as possible. And uh, hopefully we increase by giving a high dose of methadone the possibility of the client to stay on site and not want it to go back in the street. Mm -hmm. The street have nothing to offer. It's like a ghost town. There is no tourists. There is no money. People are afraid of each other. So for the people who sell the homeless newspaper, it's also a problem for them, even without any corona symptom, just having a uh, usual homelessness life is complicated. Uh -huh. So for how, drug users, even more. How do you see the, the reaction from the general society? Like, does it make them feel more solidarity to people or they just uh, think about themselves? No, uh, yeah. solidarity, I, I was expecting more uh, solidarity towards the homeless, for example, selling the street newspaper. And what I heard from the street sellers is that people are very distant and give less. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe Aukio can say something about the general uh, city of Amsterdam in terms of solidarity, because there are some positive uh, impact of this. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, yes. Want to... Go ahead. Uh, yes, I want to add, uh, add something on this, because indeed it's true that we hear stories that on the streets people donate and don't buy the the newspaper. But on the other hand, here in Amok, I also we experience a, a lot of solidarity. There's a lot of people who knock at the door and ask us uh, if, if we need help. There's new volunteers coming. There's people from the neighborhood every day who bring us cakes and bring us food. And, and this kind of support is, is more than it normally is. So I, I, yeah, that's a positive, uh, positive sign of solidarity here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of uh, reports, for example, in Hungary about uh, uh, that there is more domestic violence uh, after the lockdown than before. Yeah. Do you also experience that? I would Me. like to say something because finally here, we do not notice in our target group a raise of domestic violence because people have no house. And even if there was violence towards client, we are somehow first responder, we have to um, how you say that? We have to uh, to be careful if we notice violence toward client that we will report it to the correct authorities. Mm -hmm. uh, now about domestic violence in the general public, my wife worked for an organization in charge of uh, kids at school who are already struggling with family problematic. And yes, there is an increase of uh, request for help. Um, it doesn't mean yet that there is an increase of domestic violence or child abuse, but the message are that parents are seeking for more help because the lockdown is getting long. And we know that with the time, the longer it lasts, the more there will be probably an increase of domestic violence or uh, child neglect. Mm -hmm. um, so is there any like 
specific risk uh, for for migrant people now like who, who maybe you have a lot of uh, clients who are not citizens of the Netherlands so do they face any problems specific problems so uh, strange yeah. enough when the lockdown started we were thinking that we would make no intake whatsoever because the borders are closed so one practical aspect is if people want to return to their country of origin they might not be able to do so mm -hmm. We have a client at the moment who was looking to waiting to go back to the Czech Republic. The border is closed, so he has to stay here on a st standby. Mm -hmm. Okay, you want to what we see something? is that there are intakes of people who have been under the radar for many years in Amsterdam. People who have been working black, buying illegal methadone in the street for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and now there is no more job. So then they start to appear, and we do intakes of this. this particular target group now mm -hmm. on the other hand also um, now the um, the facilities that that where our clients normally don't have access to uh, because they don't have the right for uh, for social care now uh, during the crisis they do have the right also for night shelter uh, and that kind kind of services so that is uh, yeah also a positive thing the clients cannot move, so they, they, they are stuck here. Uh, but, at, but at least now they can access to, to uh, yeah, harm reduction services. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that also counts for, for undocumented people. They, we have a, quite a big group in, in Amsterdam as well. Maybe not if you compare it with other cities, but there's still still a big group. Uh, we were sleeping in, um, yeah, in, in garages and uh, that kind of place, unsafe places. And now also in the last week, so there's organized two extra day shelters and one night shelter specifically for this group to, yeah, to keep them inside. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned, you both of you mentioned that uh, a lot of people lost their incomes because there is no tourism, no possibilities. So. What is, is the government doing something to support people to substitute their income uh, during the yeah. crisis? Yeah, yeah, of course, only the, the, the people who have uh, legal jobs and uh, uh, yeah, but they are supporting people uh, with, uh, with social benefits. Yeah. And, and if, if someone is like a sex worker, how, what can she do or he do? Yeah, they can apply for the same social benefits as any other uh, any other worker if it's a uh, yeah if it's legal. Mm -hmm. And that is is like the those people who work in the sex industry in Amsterdam. Do they left now? Did they go back to the, to Eastern Europe or are they still there in the city? They are not working because the contact um, work is not allowed. So most of them are, are, are not working and. Um, no, I mean, a lot, a lot of people are still here also because it's not so easy to travel. Mm -hmm. So and how do you see the, the future? Like uh, how long do you think this uh, lockdown can be maintained and, uh, uh, and how, how, what will happen in the future? It's very hard to tell. It's very hard to tell. The government is very careful to not uh, make projection on a long term, it's months after months. So we know now that we will continue the operating service as it is today until 1st of June. And after they will give advice probably for the months of June, at the end of June for the months of July and so on. There are different ideas behind uh, making this lockdown a bit more supple. But still, it has been very clear that there will be no return to normal activity, at least until September, October. That means for hotel, restaurant, cafe, clubs, nightclubs, sex work, etc. The season is dead. For us, uh, we go on month by month. I don't expect that we will come back to normal uh, before, let's say, October, because we also expect eventually a second wave. The government said there might be a second lockdown uh, after the summer. Let's continue working like this and not project too long because we don't know ourselves. Mm -hmm. So many people in the working in harm reduction say that this crisis can also be used as an opportunity to 
you know, change some outdated rules. For example, you mentioned OST uh, rules. Do you think that uh, these kind of more flexible, uh, uh, progressive rules can stay after the crisis? Yes. Yeah. Well, what 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 we see now is that with this with this extra shelters and this extra support, uh, I would really like them to stay. Um, we we experience way less aggression in Amok since the people can just sleep at night and have some food and a shower. It's actually it's so easy, uh, and it's a big big change in our clients. So. So what I hope uh, for, for the future, this extra shelters will stay. And I also would advise to invest more in social work. So, so the shelter is not the end station, but um, social workers can work on individual level with people to improve, improve their lives for a for long term. But this can be a good start, uh, I, I would say. I, I would really, yeah, I, I would really like to continue with these extra shelters and then and then work from there of course yeah and about the OST the, the substitution programs it has been twice in the history of uh, drug policies in the Netherlands that they facilitate the access to methadone the first time was at the beginning of the heroin uh, epidemic in the 90s second time was at the end of the 90s with mm -hmm. sex workers um, now, this is the new opportunity. That means many of our clients, visitors of the user's room, will end up at, at the end of the COVID-19 crisis with a substitution, which probably will have to build down or stop. But once you start substitution program, it's complicated to stop it or to reduce it. So we might see people who will finally, this, this crisis is their opportunity to enter a substitution program for a longer period than just the crisis. Mm -hmm. And that is my hope. Yeah. Finally, any lessons learned you, you would like to share with, uh, with other countries, with other harm reduction uh, workers in other cities? Um, well, I, th I think what I just said in your, your previous uh, question that um, uh, I think we, we learned in this crisis that it's, um, worth to, to invest in shelters for the homeless people. Um, and um, yeah, for the rest, yeah, probably there's a lot of uh, lessons uh, to be learned globally. And uh, I think the next time a crisis like this will come, uh, we know better what to do because we already experienced it once. So all the, yeah, I think. And for me, I've been writing a lot uh, uh, in, in regard to the drug consumption room, I really recommend as lesson learned that we can continue to operate, but differently. We don't have to stop the services. It's very important to keep the continuity of the service because we are somehow a uh, drop-in center, drug consumption room, one of the only place they have left somehow, this homeless population. So we are some, somehow very important in their daily routine of surviving the street. But we also can learn a lot from other countries. When I see that in England, they facilitate the methadone substitution very quick, that in other cities, they, they took over all the hotels to, to let the homeless not being in the street. We could also inspire, uh, let's say the Netherlands could get also inspired from other countries. Okay. Okay, Cedric, thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, thank you for those who are watching us. Please follow us on uh, Facebook and uh, on Twitter. Uh, we will continue our uh, stories from the Frontline series. Uh, stay informed and stay safe. Goodbye. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.